Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Service Monster Podcast. My name is Joe Kowalski, and I am your host today. Uh, we've got some mobile releases that we want to talk about. Um, we've done a minor Service Monster 6.4 release. 6.5 is coming up very soon. A couple smug posts that we want to touch on, kind of clarify and praise and support you guys. If you're on Smug, if you're not on Smug and you're a Service Monster user, you should ask us how to get on Smug. Uh, we take v- feedback there very seriously, and you can get support for some of your favorite features that you would like us to work on. But before we do all that, we'd like to kind of give you a, a how-to. How to capture, how to turn your business into a lead capture engine, a machine. We're coming up on the busier season, so we wanted to give you kind of a five-step plan on how to turn your business into a lead and sales processing machine. That sum that up, right? Uh, that's exactly what I got here, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, like you said, we're going to break it down into five steps. Um, I think it actually worked really well in the last podcast, too, when we are talking about the smart plan, like breaking it into steps like that. Um, but kind of start with step one and identifying and you, your seasonal business. And Yeah, I mean, if you look at your reports, <laughs> there's definitely an ebb and flow. And I am surprised by people's being surprised come February when the coffers are running low and they ain't got no work. This is a seasonal business. That's going to how that that's going to how that's played out. Um, That's how that's going to play out. (laughs) So if you pay attention to that, that means you can ride those waves up. And so if you don't have something put in place before the season hits, you're going to be dropping stuff all over the place that you could be capturing, adding to your base, which if you're doing your client retention right, helped compound your overall growth. Um, But if you're just chasing your tail every busy season and sad face every slow season, and you're not doing yourself any favors by automating and making sure that every single lead you push is at least qualified and then uh, action, some action is taken as quickly as possible, then, you know, I don't know how serious you are about growing your business. Right. So knowing that, knowing those seasonal trends allows you to kind of look at, hey, we're about to hit a bigger one, right? March, April is coming up. We're, uh, you know, just in the beginning of February. So right now is a good time to put all this stuff in order while you're a little bit slower. And yeah, you're going to have to spend 50, 80, 100 bucks to, kind of get things primed, but you want to hit the ground running when that weather breaks and people start getting cleaning services again. So, you know, being ready for that, having a plan, having things set up, having things tested and know that you're ready to, to weather that onslaught that you've engineered. is a good idea. Absolutely. And I love how you kind of touched on what number two is during that, which is client retention, your current client base and making sure that you're not losing them out out the backside. Client retention, client retention, client retention, client retention. Your best source of new sales is from your current clients, especially in a repeat. Now, okay, we've picked up some followers recently. They're like, I'm transactional. You know, I do it. I refinish a floor, which hell, I used to do that. I did that for a year. Hardwood floor insulation and refinishing. Like, okay, yeah, I get it. That's a transactional business. You might be able to get the other bedrooms down the road, right? But it's really tough to build a business. And all. But, you know, vast majority of the people who watch us, they're cleaners who survive or can grow aggressively with a good client retention strategy. And so it always amazes me on the boards. They're like, I'm starving. I need work. How long have you been in business? Three years. What are you doing for your current clients? Nothing. Ugh. Like you're not taking advantage of that compounding. You're losing them, like you said, out of the backside. They're going to some other competitor who's going to be more than willing to stay in touch. So be that stay in touch person. Have some sort of a regular plan, a regular content production, a email newsletter, a direct mail newsletter, some sort of a direct mail campaign that contacts them, an email campaign that contacts them based off their last invoice date, and keep that train rolling. And pay attention. See what they say. See what cards are left behind when you go clean the room. What's the general attitude of Mrs. Jones? And there'll be a couple people that'll be like, yo, dog, unsubscribe. Like, okay. 
that's fine. As long as it's like one or two percent, not a big deal. Um, you know, email rates are twenty percent, open rates twenty percent, click through rates, you know, less than that. Yeah. So you know, it's um, you, you play the game and you pay attention and you dial it in, but you must have a client retention strategy that you do all the time, that you're consistent and intentional. Uh, so that's going to be the plan, um, p- part of the plan, which is going to give you the most reward if you're not already accomplishing it. So for step three, let's kind of talk about some of the channels that they can focus on to really kind of drive this lead capture into actually, you know, creating sales. Yeah. So it's good to talk about it, chat about it. And it's all nebulous in theory. And it's like, okay, Joe, but what do I do? Right. Right. We've given you some good examples with um, client retention. You've got email and direct mail campaigns targeting based off last invoice date. Uh, You've got a consistent sort of newsletter, whether that's direct mail or email or some combination of both. Can I just interject something too? Yeah, please. Um, I think sometimes too, especially on the client retention, but it also goes for new sales too. The time to be hitting them is not when you expect them to be coming back through the wave and getting the work done. The time to hit them is before that. Right. So like they're never forgetting your name. So when something does come up, oh right, I want to go to Joe's carpet. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, because you can't intersect their need with your marketing. That's how you get one offs exactly, and you get one or two percent off a of one off, and you never get any better. And there's no silver bullet, and it's this holistic approach. Again, multiple channels. You can't look at one channel and go, dude, where do you get all your leads from? Oh, I run this one killer advertising on Facebook and it's my whole business. Well, first of all, that's scary because eventually that will go away and then and then you're sunk. So, you know, being a master of multiple channels is wise, um, especially when those channels rules change and it takes you a minute to kind of figure out and catch up. So... Two places where they always have to land. So let's start with that. Hopefully you've got a business line, <laughs> right? You've got an actual <laughs> yeah. business phone number. Um, some some hacks here are going to be like Ring Central, which means you can have your both personal phone and your business phone land on your phone. Right. Um, so, you know, Grasshopper, I think, is another one. Ring Central, Grasshopper. Um, you, you want a business phone. Okay, so that means all your marketing material is going to have that business phone. And if you get a little bit more sophisticated, you can have multiple phone numbers for different marketing channels so you know what triggered their response. All right, so a phone number, place to land, place to call you. That way, if you're sending direct mail or you're doing flyers or glad handing or any of the other channel mechanisms, um, they can pick up the phone. Go to your website, pick up the phone. But the other, and, and as important now in 2020, is a lead capture form. Hey, I need some work done and services. Here's some information. Send me some stuff. Hit me up. And so your website being able to funnel contact information is important. Then that way, either the phone call or the website, you're bringing all channels, all marketing avenues to those two places. Websites 24-7. And the phone is only as good as the as the availability you have to answer that phone because you guys most of the time aren't answering your damn phones or you have an answering service which is good varying degrees of good better than nothing some process right i call those wins are they going to be as good as the sales business owner no and he's gonna be pissed off all the time at it but guess what phone's being answered it doesn't have a whirring machine in the background and Mrs. Jones isn't eyeing you from the back corner over her phone while you're talking on her time. Yeah, there's a quote that I heard once where it's anything worth doing is also worth doing poorly. Like it's better to brush your teeth for 30 seconds than to do it properly or to not do it at all, I mean. And so, yes, answering the phone, you're going to have, as the business owner, the most direct knowledge to pass on to your, your clients. Right. But the next step down is still a whole lot better than the phone not getting answered. You see, that makes me feel bad about not brushing my teeth now. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I could just go and be done, and that would be better than doing nothing. Right. Yeah. Of course, by that point, you're like, ah, I might as well spend the two minutes. Exactly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, once you have your landing platform, your phone and your website kind of dialed in, and we'll talk about the process by which that lead capture can happen and automate it and notifications, all that stuff. Um, but once you have those in place, then it opens up. So you can go Facebook and Instagram, social, hot social media places for service providers, um, creating value content and ads 
video and written word and images and before and afters and really disgusting videos and then a beautiful video after we just wrote a grossology contest that we're picking the winner for this week so that's fun so you have all of these tools available to you and then those advertisings and those call to action should end up with call us or go to the website and see if you can convert them on the website from a website browser to an actual lead they fill out the form so um, other places where you can gather leads of course glad handing going out and kissing babies and shaking hands and um, knocking on doors for commercial business right I and mean, you can go door to door in residential depending on certain areas of the country have different attitudes about it but um, commercial never goes out of style if you're looking to add or expand that area of your business um, flyers fairly inexpensive although you're polluting so people get pissed but it works right people do it it works um, door hangers for your five rounds right um, EDDM for direct mail campaigns on prospecting I think that's a very cost-effective and targeted way to do it um, every door direct mail if you don't if, if you if I'm blasting through something you're like well, what is what is that write it down and go find out what it is. Otherwise, this is going to be a three-hour show. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and we have talked about these in depth in other podcasts. So if you've been listening to us over time, you're kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, check, check, check. Um, you know, advertising traditional, like the Little League field, right? The back fence of the Little League field. They're vans advertising. Um, so making sure that that's good. Door hangers or, or not door hangers, but uh, yard signs. You know, really simple, cheap, effective. Right? Just throw them out there. Um, especially on longer term projects, like you're there for a day or two. Right. Then you, the way the truck's not there, you know, the yard signs. You definitely want itself. all the neighbors kind of wondering who's doing this great work. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, obviously you've got email campaigns, but you have had to acquire the email address first. So it's not a great like screen scraping or buying email list. That's just a bad idea. Um, you can do um, purchase lists, prospect lists based off your targeting demographic, which really the whole thing, yes, you want all these channels, but the channels, the the um, amount of resources you put into each channel is grossly dependent on who your target demographic is. Uh, so, and while I agree that you may want to establish yourself early in certain platforms like and while TikTok might be fun, I don't think yet you're going to get much business from junior high kids. Right. Right. I, you know, maybe if they threw a party and their their parents are away and they're coming back like, oh, shit. And they, <laughs> like, I've never even heard of that story as fun as it would be. Right. Um, so you got to go where your target demographic is. What is your target demographic? Well, what is the general the place I would first start is what is the general profile of your star client? Not your average client, not your any client, not everyone in your database. Like the top 10 or 20% of your clients are like, man, I wish I had a lot of you guys. Right. You need to focus on those guys. Uh, and what is their profile? Where do they work, worship, or play? And where do they hang out on social media? And where, you know, and then that's where you go and that's the content you make and that's you do it on a regular basis so you can stay top of mind so when they finally have the problem that you're the solution then they can contact you via your phone or your website so focusing on the places where they are the most and then kind of mapping that out it's like oh wow 80 percent of them actually are on facebook holy crap okay well that's important to know and then oh I've uploaded my list now to Facebook, uh, my email list, and it's matched against profiles. So now I have this custom audience that is my current clients. Okay, that's cool because the number one source, uh, if you are trading on integrity and value, is going to be referrals. Right? So all these other channels are great, but if you're using those other channels to help facilitate referrals, like by contacting your current clients on a regular basis, so when they get a friend who says, hey, I need a cleaner, Bing. Oh, let me link you. I just, right. Or you're delivering them a value and you know, they're like, wow, I really like stay clean cleaners like those guys. I didn't know that hydrogen peroxide wasn't as effective as I thought it was. All right. So 
it's really staying in front of those potential clients, but really staying in front of your clients too and helping build that awareness and then developing a referral rewards program. So that's your channels. Those are your channels. I just ran through them real quick, but that's kind of all encompassing. Well, also on the referral front, um, yes, you want to have that referral reward program going, but you also want to make sure that your reviews are being captured for those that aren't necessarily coming directly uh -huh. from your clients. That's right. So um, because that way, you can get benefit from the referrals of people they don't know exactly via a review platform, right? Uh, also, also, don't stick to one platform. Distribute that shit up a little bit because the last thing you need is for them to go, ah, oh, something's weird there, boom, and they flip a switch and all of a sudden all your 500 referrals on Google are gone. Then you're like, what just happened? What do I do? Facebook just did this, right? They just took away the star rating. Now it's recommends, don't recommends. Right. Um, although the people who were gathering star ratings are now riding on that star rating, right? So it's it's very odd. We're 4.8 if you had to <laughs> guess. <laughs> just, just to make sure that. So, you know, um, I think that's the channels. I think you're right. And building the referral uh, rewards program and reviews is a big part of that. Yeah, like the... The studies have shown, especially in recent years, reviews are almost always the first thing that a potential new client is going to look at. And so you want to position yourself towards the top of that and you want to make sure volume. You don't want to have two really good reviews and then nothing. Right. Because generally people are going to look at that and be like, okay, well, is this your friend? Like, is right. this someone who's yeah, yeah. self reviewed? Right. And the wife. It's actually, there's like a psychological thing too that people will kind of, it's an Amazon thing. You see it where if, it, if it's five star, they'll actually bypass it. Whereas if it's four, eight, four, nine, like, okay, that's probably legit. They had a couple of scenarios. It's very interesting, the psychology. But no, it. don't spoof your reviews exactly. though. I don't want to give exactly. that impression. Like we don't condone that at all. Everything has to be organic. We're kind of um, guilty of this on some platforms because we don't push reviews. Uh, and so like Google plus is like not a place where a lot of people have reviewed us if, if any, like maybe one or two. So, you know, if you go looking, hey, well, that's because we go where our clients go, right? And lots of them on Facebook, um, lots of them on Instagram. So that's kind of where we hang out. So now we've got the kind of channels broken down. What's the actual process that we want to be focused on, um, starting with gathering their attention? Yeah, so this is either a micro transaction or a long term game plan. The microtransactions, pretty easy. The gathering of the attention is they pull out the big jumbo card. You've got their attention. It's a big jumbo card. You made it colorful. You have a big smiling face or something attractive on the card that pleases the eye, creates an endorphin. And now you have their attention. Right? And then all of the other steps can follow through from that one interaction with that postcard. But I think it's better to develop the longer term strategy. Most prospects will need to see your brand eight times before they will purchase for a product or service that you provide that they may need. I, and I say it a million times, but nobody buys carpet cleaning services when they're standing on clean carpet. They only get your services when they think they have a problem and it's a problem you can solve. And so if you send one mailing out right? One email blast, one Facebook campaign. You're hoping that your single advertisement and its copy is compelling enough to that very small portion of the audience who has the problem that you can solve right now. And so the approach of capturing attention and holding attention is designed over a longer period of time to keep your brand top of mind. And that way, when they have the problem, they already know who to call because you've made your name synonymous with the products and services they need. So that's why attention is important. Keeping and maintaining attention, either in the micro transaction or over the long term, maintaining the attention of your target demographic is the first step towards anything. Because without the attention, you can't sell them. So now we have their attention. How do we keep them engaged? How do we? Well, um, it can't be add, 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 add. Again, the micro example, it's the only the add, right? And you might get a 1% off that. On the longer scale, if the only content they're seeing from you is buy my book, buy my book, then they're going to tune out really quickly. If you're mixing it up, 
if you're providing content that they go, oh, that's interesting. That was funny. I learned something. I was entertained. I've been persuaded, like the different styles of content and their purposes. And you've been able to capture the attention. You maintain their attention and get engagement by talking about things they care about. Every once in a while, you can give a really great ad, which will help promote engagement. The like, the share, the share is the big one, right? That's the holy grail. Um, the comment, the interaction, the discussion, the phone call, the visit to the website, the website click, right? Whatever course of action you're hoping for over the long term as your brand is built and you're gathering attention, you're really hoping to keep them engaged in some way. If they're performing action, whether it's even eyeballs on your post, they stop for a minute, they scan it, they chuckle to themselves, wasn't enough for a like, but it was fun, then they keep scrolling. That kind of engagement is very valuable. And by the way, if any of you guys are listening to this and you're like, mm, social media, it's not really my thing. I'm not very good at it. A, there's lots of information out there on how to help set up that. I mean, we live in the information age, right? We and, have a whole course we did like three years ago or four yep. years ago. It's still totally relevant. Absolutely. And you might have someone on your team who maybe is a little bit younger demographic might be able to help you too. That's right. Yeah. Um, and it's not all, you know, all of these examples aren't strictly social media. The same thing can be said for an email letter or a newsletter. Like, what are you putting in the content that would make them click through and want to read it? Um, are you talking about your, you know, your life and your family? People find that very compelling and engaging. I think you mentioned earlier too, like sharing some tips and tricks, you know, making yourself the expert that they want to listen to. Totally. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the easiest way, right? Is to say, look, I, I'm doing this service for them. That makes me an expert on the services and related services. And so as an authority, I can speak to those in such a way where it maintains their attention and provides them with value. Yeah. Um, and so that's the easiest path. And then blending in some of your more interesting life stories or hardships, right? Um, being inspirational in some way, if that's a story you can um, you can use to inspire others. If you have a really boring life and, you know, it's not a big deal, of course, it's always, every, I think everybody has a fascinating story, even if it's, even if it's like the mundane, because I've yet to, it would be interesting to sit down with somebody who told me a story and the whole time I felt, wow, this is totally mundane. Like your life <laughs> has just been like, like, Right. Like this, like very even, like I've yet to meet that person. Meeting that person itself would be interesting. Yeah, I think everyone's interesting in their own way. That's right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, you can leverage that. You leverage your own passions, like your sports teams, your barbecues, your farming life, you know, whatever. Um, so that's on the social front. But again, the newsletters on the email, same thing. Uh, direct mail, similar stuff. Maybe even prospecting, you know, mentioning your family or your fishing or like whatever. Um tying into that personal aspect really helps keep the attention and gets the engagement. And again, it's not just about, I use these words that have been now beat to death in social media, but I'm talking across all the channels that we talked about before. Having a conversation with somebody in a community barbecue, getting their attention, maintaining their interest, getting their engagement, not standing there saying, sell, 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 buy my book, buy my book. Right. It's exactly the same thing. So here's a tidbit for all your social media people. Take yourself out of freaking social media for a minute. Go do a barbecue and use all of those great things that you've learned with real people and real interactions and put the phone in your pocket for a couple hours and see what happens because there's that side of the world too. So I think it goes both ways, right? You know, boomers aren't engaging to the same degree and yet you've got millennials who aren't putting the phone down for meaningful interaction it, if they're winning in their respective arenas, right? So if the business boomer who's killing it on handshaking, like if he doesn't need to go to social, it's kind of like, eh, eh. And then again, the reverse is true. Like, why would I leave my room? Like, I'm just collecting leads left and right, right here. So um, I think I think a broader base, more experience is required. Get out of your comfort zone. Look for additional channels and then start seeing if your demographics hangs out there. Yeah. So now that we've got their attention. Yep. We've maintained that engagement. Yep. Now let's make an offer. 
Yeah, so um, I, I say the ratio on the social platform is like three to one, four to one. So for every three piece of value content, you can put together a nice, compelling, visually appealing ad. Um, and that's made to make the offer. Like, here's what I can do for you. And and, and I don't necessarily mean offer like $5 off. Like, you don't have to be that discount cleaner. I strongly disagree with that. People pay for what they're willing to pay for if you set it up right. Um, so the offer is really about just being upfront. Hey, I have this. You might need it. When you need it, let me know. Here's how you do it and make it super duper easy. So that's got to be the biggest thing, right? It, that button to click, that phone to tap on the number that gives them the, the ability to dial. Like, it's got to be so easy that that it presents no resistance because any resistance will start to lose a fraction of the people going down the journey. Oh, that's interesting. Tap. 404, page not found. I'm out. Done. Like all that advertising, all that work you did, all that setup you did, all the web form, everything you misdirected because you made a typo and you didn't test it. Oops. Yep. Phone numbers, uh, misspelling in the phone number, right? A typo. You transpose two digits. Now the people calling are calling, you know, Mrs. Smith. And she's like, I've never heard of steam clean steamery. Or right. just go straight to voicemail. Or you don't have a voicemail set up, God forbid. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or it's full. Yeah. Mailbox full. Like, uh, really? Really? You're not even businessing, dude. Sorry, bra. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, so making the offer, saying, here I am. Love me. Here's what I can do for you. Um, but only after you've you know, establish that you're not going to put this in their face every post. Yeah, and this kind of ties into the next step. which Or is every the, newsletter or every. Right. right. But this is now the next step of capturing that. So you've got the offer and now we need to actually capture I, I always think of it as kind of like a, a funnel. funnel. Yep. You've got this giant funnel where everything is being caught. And you just want to make sure that the pathway now, itty bitty down at the bottom, focus on, like you said, the website and, and the phone. Now we've got the information. Which yeah. Is. So, um, so now capturing, right? So we've got them directed. We've got the call to action. Now they want to either pick up the phone and call you and then talk to you and have a conversation, give you an opportunity to sell or one step removed from that. They want to fill out that information on the web form, which then goes into your queue and gets you notified and you should follow up with them either email, text or phone call as quickly as humanly possible um, to then close that deal. Um, and so that's like the final step, right? Sales, like you got to sell them. If it doesn't sell, if you're doing your data collection, right? They are now in a pipeline of content. So they're in a stream of content, which says maybe they'll buy later. And some of them are unsubscribing to your content. That's okay. As long as it's a small portion, again, like 1%, 2%, no big deal. Um, that tells you you're probably doing it enough. If it's too high, five, ten percent, yeah, stop. Something's wrong, and you're delivering no value to people. Um, and if it's zero percent, then I would say you're probably not hitting them enough. Maybe giving them amazing content, not always, not ever asking for the sale. That's you know, the whole point here is to provide leads and a source of income for the business. Yeah. So even if you don't get them, if you did that capture portion right, now you're, you know, the clothes fall short. Ah, let me think about it. I talked talk it over with my husband. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that's right for me. Ooh, that was a little more than I was expecting. Let me get back to you after tax season. Like whatever the reason is, well, now you've got them in a drip. You're either sending out a regular direct mail or based off some sort of triggers and events or timing, um, or you're sending them regular emails um, again, with the value content and then every once in a while and ask, and you're trying to stay top of mind to the leads that you worked so hard to gather because they already had a little inkling to look you up anyway. So might as well stay in front of them until either they're ready to buy or they don't want to hear from you anymore. Right. Yep. So now we've gone through that kind of process. We hit the last step. And this is one that you you talk about a lot. Um, we've definitely brought it up on the podcast numerous times, and that's automating some of this. 
automation in general. Yeah. yeah. I mean, answering the phone, right? We've been doing that forever. So you get a phone number, the phone rings. Duh. And then your actionable item there is pick up your damn phone. And then, then you have the engagement and then you have your sell. So it's almost like your micro transaction again. So even if you've been doing a macro long game trickle through multiple channels, delivering both value and advertising, and then they trigger, then the phone rings. And finally, the, that individual says, you know what? I got this problem. I'm going to call Joe's cleaning. The phone rings. He answer the phone. And now you've got a micro chance to... You know, and when I say that, I don't mean like there's a small chance, but the event is small. It's transactional. It's going to occur within three to five minutes. And you're going to say, okay, um, qualify, greeting, qualifying, pitch, and close. Greeting, here's who I am. Here's what we do. Are you in the right store? Are you in the right place? Qualifying, is this someone who's going to be willing to pay my prices and um, is this not going to be a problem client? Is this something that we can even service? Is this a product or service that we can even take care of? Um, pitch. After you've qualified the client, a big portion of qualification is listening. What is the client's need? What is their problem? Um, pitch. How can you solve that problem? How is your company uniquely suited to provide them the best value? Um, and the close. And get the money. Uh, close the deal, make the handshake. They say, do it like schedule the appointment. Um, so going through that sales effort is fine, but it's usually longer than that. There's usually follow-up involved. And when you have a web capture form, which we didn't used to have back in, you know, 95, um, then you'd capture that information on the phone call, hopefully. And then from there, they can go into drip and trickle and all that fun stuff. Um, the web form, the easiest, most unsophisticated form of this would be an email form. So it captures a few fields. You, they type it in and they hit a button, submit. Uh, and then it takes those fields, first name, last name, phone number, address, stuffs them in an email and sends you an email. That's the most rudimentary. The most advanced would be something like Zapier, where you've got a form that you send the data to a Zap in Zapier, and from there you distribute it across multiple channels. You send out custom emails immediately, you put it in your CRM, you raise notifications, maybe your CRM raises notifications on top of you that. You might even have something that has a schedule that it just schedules them directly. Totally, right. right. Um, and so there's, you know, there's, a, there's a wide range of complication here. But without automating it and then executing on the follow-up, it doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter what the form looks like. It doesn't, I mean, if somebody fills it out and there's no execution on it, um, or if someone fills it out and doesn't go anywhere, like it goes into an email into the ether and it just disappears and nobody does anything with it, then it's pointless. Um, and you're just going to piss off people who are like, well, I contacted you via your web form and you never got back to me, so I have no interest in doing business with you. I'm going through this right now with a car purchase. <laughs> like, what? Nobody's nobody wants to take my money. What are you? <laughs> what? So weird. Anyway, so it's um, automating it is a big deal. Certain portions can be automated. Um, follow up sequences on you know information transfers in the CRM. Automated drip emails. Um, you can even get in direct mail. Service Monster has some pretty incredible automation tools for lead follow-up and, you know, then handling of the follow-up itself through opportunities, Kanbans, or activity management screens. And also some of our third-party vendors are really good at this process of churning a lead in the beginning and then spitting out an actual sale. Responsive bid comes to mind, right? Absolutely, yeah. Responsive bid is all about that kind of pre-sale process. And it the reason why it's gotten so popular over the last couple of years is that it's constantly figuring out what the initial need was, like you said, um, and then always trying to give them the best value while showcasing everything else you could potentially do. So it's upselling without really feeling like an upsell. Yeah, that's good. And then it's hitting all of those immediate follow-ups, which you have full control over. You can say you know, when you want it to, to follow up. I mean, on their on their Facebook um, kind of page, they're always having like, yeah, no, I had this bid that was a year ago. 
And they just followed up and they finally followed through with it because right. it was a larger kind of you know project. And yeah, you can capture all that over there, have them do the follow up, and then at the end of the day, get it scheduled and boom, it pops right over. Yeah. Um, and, and again, you can do some of this in more rudimentary way uh, directly within Service Monster um, with our order approval. Yep. Right. You can send out. So not only do you have, you know, pay me online, here's a link, but you also have, here's the order I want to run by you. Um, and if you like it, go ahead and approve it and we can start on work. And this is great for exterior cleaning when, you know, your interaction with the client isn't always mandatory. Um, maybe they won't be on site when you're there. Um, you know, maybe they're, you know, doing something else, who knows, but being able to do that automated uh, via websites and on the client's time, that's a big deal. And then response a bid with their maybe more complete automation and follow-up sequencing that they got pre-built in to really help you close those deals. So that whole point of automation, like you, you should be, you know, zap your proficient as a business owner at this point, I feel. If you're using technology in your business, you want to automate these processes. That's got to be a big component. Service Monster has over 30 zaps and triggers. Um, if you look us up, we're not there yet. We haven't cut all the red tape. They changed the rules right when we rolled out. It used to be pretty simple, you know, make sure things are working and tested. Kind of like, I felt like iOS. Now it's ridiculous. Now it's like, it takes, it's going to take us a month to figure out how to get listed. But if you need Zapier, we have an invite link. Right. So you can search for Service Monster Zapier invite link. It'll come up in a blog post somewhere um, or send a um, question to support, hit me up on social or whatever. And I feel like they have some pretty well thought out kind of help pages to help you guys work it out. But they phrase everything in questions that are pretty easily understood. Like, what do you want this to do? I want it to make an account when it does this. Yep. So that's yeah. basically what it's asking. Yeah, it, is, it takes the programming side out of programming out of it and allows you to connect your systems together. Yep. Um, and Service Monster is a big proponent of that. We want you guys to have best, you know, the best resources for the best product. Responsive Bid's got dedicated resources towards this part of the pipeline. Service Monster's dedicated on data management and CRM and you know, all the other million things that we do as a central hub. But if we can get you guys connected to specialized individuals through the marketplace to do these functions and automate them, then it's just like adding employees to your business. It's super duper powerful. Yep. And there's other parts of this that aren't necessarily tied to just the sales part. You already touched on the fact, you know, we have the Kanban in there with sales opportunities. Yep. You can make either a call list or an email follow-up yep. that's automated. Activity management's yep. great. But there's also things we talked about before um, on the client retention side. So you can set up those drip campaigns. You can yep. set up fill my schedule. Yep. Um, so that runs out automatically at certain intervals. intervals. And you can set up your reviews through something like Nice Job or Broadly or one of our other partners there so that it's capturing that information when the work is done. Then they handle the review follow-ups. You don't have to constantly remember to you know make sure that you're catching those reviews. Let that other software help you with that too. That's right. So there's all these the different parts that can all be automated that all are kind of tying back into this original goal. And you can whiteboard this all out, right? I mean, you know, we, we birthed this particular podcast from uh, a, a quick whiteboard diagram, but I would be encouraging you to look at your business through the lens of process. What happens here? What happens here? Here's a decision tree. Here's an endpoint. Um, and then kind of then plugging the pieces like, what can I automate? What can I eliminate? What can I streamline? What am I not doing now I should be doing? And again, focus on, you know, channels where your demographics hanging out, your current clients, client retention efforts, making sure you're it's super easy and dead dumb simple for the people who are interested to go through those paths, collecting that data, acting on that data in a quick manner, putting them in some sort of a regular contact program, developing content that's value to sales on a three to one, and then making the sale when it's ready and uh, automating as much of that as possible. I think the only other thing that I would add on to this, which we could probably have a whole other podcast on this, but if you don't know how to do some of these things, I already said we're in kind of the information age. There's a lot of research you can go do out there that's actually free. Tons. Or network with someone who maybe does. Maybe yeah. they do a specific process really, really, really well. YouTube is an amazing platform, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, you can get steered the wrong way a little bit, but I mean, a lot of this stuff is just objective like, it's not like, I'm going to teach you to, to what copy to use to make magic happen. No, it, what 
button do I need to click? What list do I need to upload? Um, content creation is the creative part that still relies on you and your creativity. But the rest of it is just a form of function. It's just a machine, just like the truck mount, yep. right? Just like the piece of equipment, just like anything. Yeah. Cool. Great stuff. Yeah. So uh, where are we going from here? So from here, I think we'll talk about some updates on the Service Monster side. Then there's also a couple of little fun kind of news things we can talk about here too. Um, we had release 6.4.7.5. Um, and yeah, it's a lot of numbers, but all you guys really need to know is that it unlocked the laborer role. Ah, and fun. so now there's a new, it's extremely restricted and that's by design, um, that you can set a role so that if you have someone who's just kind of needs to know what work needs to be done and really not a whole lot more, then that's what you want. It's going to hide prices. It's going to allow very little edit capability. It's um, a living route packet. Exactly. What do I need? Where am I going? Um, what do I need to know before I get there, how to get there, and then what do I need to know when I'm there as far as what am I doing? But it still allows them to view all the notes and check in and check out of the job. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Um, there are also some bug fixes and some small features in that. We have the release notes online. Um, definitely think if you guys haven't already, make sure you take a look. Yep. We also had a mobile release. Um, we're on 1.2.7. Um, this also had ties in with the, the laborer role and it had the major change to how sites function. Everywhere in the app. Everywhere. So whether it was the estimate or the quick ad or job look at schedule order. On the account. On the account, everywhere. Yep. Um, so it's much cleaner now. If you don't use sites, meaning that your site is your default site because most of your work is residential, you don't have clients who have a lot of different sites, um, you shouldn't notice really too much of a change some support paths, you know, like, oh, I didn't, I didn't have to select that or, um, oh, I didn't know there was a plus button. Now I can add a site on the fly. That's the only change you're going to see. If you are um, a, a client or a user who does a lot of sites, boy, before this, it was really frustrating because if you didn't do everything perfect and, and even then things didn't really line up right with multiple sites, now they should be dialed in. Like everywhere you go, you should be able to, you know, really easily identify how to use it, be able to add new sites on the fly, select new sites on those different cards, uh, and the whole process is just a lot easier. Yeah. And there's some other things, too, that are pretty interesting um, that, for example, the, the signatures now that you're, you're capturing have more information on them, so it's easier to differentiate between them if you got the estimate versus the invoice. It's now going to capture the order type, the order number, and the date that it was captured. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's other little things like uh, the tech view was missing some of the calendar dots if they wanted to see what days they had jobs on. You can create a service item directly from the line item so you don't have to go constantly back and forth. Mm -hmm. It just makes that process a lot smoother. Um, oh, yeah. That was a big one. Yeah. Yeah. And there's just a lot of little kind of odds and ends like that. Again, on your app store, it's going to have these change logs that kind of show what was done. So if you that's guys... a summary for us too, exactly. though, right? But yeah, yep. Um, always mention the cleaning podcast. There is a new episode that's been out. I think a couple weeks now. Yeah, well, with um, Doyle Bloss on truck mounts. Yep. Yeah, we we cut a new one last week too, and they'll be editing and publishing it sometime here in the next week or two. Nice with, with Paul Lucas. So, yeah, go check that out, The Cleaning Podcast. It's uh, all your cleaning how-tos with the industry's most knowledgeable experts. Yeah. And there is actually a website dedicated to it, thecleaningpodcast.com, along with all of your standard kind of podcast outlets. Yeah, it's got a little player in there. And... Now, you already mentioned this, um, which is fun because I actually just I just voted on mine um, <sighs> today, the Grossology Contest. I haven't voted yet. Yeah. yeah. The Grossology Contest ended, I think, yesterday, right? It did, yeah. Yeah. And so for anyone who isn't aware, we had a contest to have you guys basically tag us with a video showing your wastewater. Not yeah. not not the category three, as yeah. you mentioned, but um, the, the grossest kind of wastewater. So you guys could make some content that you could use if you wanted. It, we forced you to make content yeah. and put it on your site, except that I hoped the thought train would be like, ew, this is really gross. 
I need to turn this into an ad and show the after. And this is like all the stuff I just pulled out of people's homes. Yep. Um, and some of you guys did that. Some of you guys just went for the gross. Yep. Uh, and we're giving away a, a, a Gary Height Light, the PP5000. There's definitely a front runner right now, too. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Totally. <laughs> um, and then uh, we're, the top gross video will get the PP5000. And the top three, we're going to do a blog post with some backlinking and um, and, and we'll host their video there on the page. So yep. very cool stuff. Yeah, it's uh, it's a nice. And we're going to start doing contests more and more. I just have fun with them. Even if we don't get huge participation, it's just like, you know, I, I'm, I have one that I really want to do. I haven't figured it out quite out yet, which is um, a first person point of view towards a service monster process. And it's the most, you know, we could do like the most creative process or the, the most streamlined process or the, you know, the the most value process in your business that Service Monster provides, which would be fun on multiple levels as both value content and advertising. Um, but I, it's also subject to copyright and it'd be weird for them to blur out right. com- customer information. And what, I mean, we can do it, but I think it would, you know, it would be hard for people that they couldn't post that content. Right. Uh, so I'm like, eh. there's a lot of steps you'd have to kind of set up as a yeah. So I got all excited and then got sad. Well, I think it's really interesting too from from our perspective is it's always fun seeing what process you have created. Yeah. Um, everyone, even if use cases, if we think we have all of them locked down, sometimes it'll come out of the blue like this is how I work it, and you're like, that's really interesting. Yeah, never seen that before, and the yeah. engineers would get a kick out of that. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's always fun to kind of see that process. Yep. That's actually why this kind of goes into the next little bit about the uh, convention that I just got back from. Yeah. It's always nice to see people face to face and get to walk through that with them because you only get so much through a screen share or a phone call or, totally. or an email conversation or whatever. Yeah. So you just came back from, was it in Vegas? It was in Vegas, yeah. The HRI uh, parent company to uh, ChemDry uh, and Enhance. Most people know the ChemDry. Um, we, they have a um, kind of a, their own convention once a year and so we go to that so this year we sent adam so uh fun it was it was a lot of fun it was definitely busy um a lot of work a lot of standing um man that's that first day when i got back i was like i wanted to go do something but i couldn't like, yep. my feet were just dead yep um this bed is looking pretty good yeah exactly <laughs> Um, but it, yeah, it was great meeting everyone, had a lot of great feedback on mobile. Mobile was definitely the hot topic of the convention. I even did like a, a, a breakout where I presented for an hour on mm-hmm. kind of the mobile features, got a lot of good feedback from that. Um, really lots of follow-up that is going out. I've already emailed some people. A lot of them kind of spend the week, like after the convention, right. kind of as a mini vacation afterwards totally. too. So it started with email and there'll be some call outs later this week, just tons of follow-up. Um, but I hope everyone that I met, you know, enjoyed the time and enjoyed the breakout, learned a lot about the mobile app. And yeah, always appreciate that feedback. Yeah, it's always a fun event. I've been a handful of times um, with everything going on with the family right now. Obviously, I wasn't going to get out there this this year, but cool. Yeah. So let's talk uh, some smug posts. Yeah. Um, just like you said at the beginning, if you guys are still listening right now, Really, if you're not in Smug, if this doesn't mean anything to you necessarily and you would like to have discussion with fellow Service Monster users, we have a process. We'll link it on the video. Service Monster user group. Yep. You have to be a Service Monster user. We generally want you to be in there 90 days because it's not a support channel. Right. You know, that's the that's the worst way to get support from us. I will intentionally ignore your shit on purpose. If it's like urgent support issue posted on Smug. Like do yourself a favor, call, call or email support or email support or chat. Right, smug is for hey guys, I have this neat thing I want to run by you where you're running it by other service monster business owners, yep. or hey Joe, where's my you know car washing feature? Right, uh, and then I go, well that's the first time anyone's asked me for a car washing feature. Let's see if we can get some support, and a bunch of people will show up and go. Nah, don't need a car washing feature. <laughs> or heck yeah, like so. It's very. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that in that way because the very first post, and we're not going to go through all of it. We'd be here all day. <laughs> um, comes oh, from, from Alan. Alan. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Alan had this wonderful. He was on post. vacation. Yeah, <laughs> that was brilliant. Um, he gave us ten items that he really wants to see. Some of them large, some of them smaller. And he's getting a lot of support. Absolutely. Yeah, and love it. 
the thing that makes me super happy about this, listen, when, when an idea comes, sometimes you just want to get the idea out there and it's just kind of whiteboarding it, right? Yeah. Like, but it's whiteboarding it to the group. He went into so much detail. Not only did he list them all first, he made separate comment chains yep. for each question so people could leave their feedback on each question. Yeah, that was brilliant. And as a data guy, I don't know, it just made me very, very, very happy. Yeah. So we got a lot of good stuff. Thank you. Yes. Alan, I'm, that was I'm great. going through that. You're going through that. Yep. Um, we'll, we'll get the, a lot of it's already been stuff that's right. been identified. Exactly. Now it can be reprioritized maybe a little bit. Like, yep. oh, all right, you guys love that one. Let's pull, pull that. And like, oh, that's super freaking easy. Let's do that. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, those lists are always great. Now, Alan might come back in a year and go, well, what happened to number seven? I asked for this a year ago. I'm not saying Alan does this. He doesn't. This is great. But, um, you know, and sometimes things make it through. They get reprioritized. Sometimes things don't, right? So, um, but the more support someone has on a feature or yep. feature set, the more likely we're going to, I keep saying it, I'll say it forever, make us. It's essentially like, like a triage system. That's There's right. There's always going to be a highest priority. Always. So, always. Um. Yeah, so the, the next post came from Ethan, and this actually just came through, which I thought was kind of funny, just under the deadline. Um, was asking about a way to make kind of a, a recurring job keeping the same work order number. And what he was really asking for is that he has a month-long project, essentially, with multiple visits. Oh, and so, not um, the way that works. Exactly. And so he already got help from Apollo, so, so thank you, Apollo. But I th- thought it was a good time to just kind of mention that fact that you can have an order with multiple appointments attached to it. Yep. Even, uh, you know, over a single the course owner. of a month. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so we're one of the more unique companies in this regard where order and job are not synonymous. And in fact, with 6.5, what you will notice is we will stop using the term job and instead start using the term appointment. Because I'm tired of fighting with you guys with the damn definition of the word job means and it doesn't matter what i say it matters what you guys say at scale and we're not using it right appointment is a much better term you can have multiple appointments with each order you can have it at any step in the process so a good example i always like to use is you can have an estimate and you can schedule an appointment for an in-home estimate and go do that in-home estimate and mrs jones says yeah sounds great let's do it and then you can convert that work, uh, that invoice, sorry, that estimate into a work order and schedule that work order when you're going to come do the work. A lot of times it's immediately, maybe not. Maybe you've got a very thorough process and you have a separate estimating team that you do from a cleaning team. So then the cleaners go out. Maybe it's a multi-day cleaning job and you can schedule those appointments while the order is a work order covering those multiple days, multiple routes with multiple resources. And then let's say that everything's done. You invoiced, everybody's happy. She pays, you're good. Then three weeks later, they call back. Now you can schedule another appointment and the appointment type here is going to be rework and a very special type. And the reason why you want to track that is well, why did we go back out after the invoice? It signals something was wrong. If Mrs. Jones wants more service, you're just going to do a new invoice. Doing a rework is another example of another appointment might you might have against an order. So you can do as many appointments as you like. There's no restriction. Um, and again, we're one of the only companies that allows that differentiation between an appointment and an order. Yeah, I think another example that really works to kind of like hone in on that is rugs or anything that's tangible that you're actually cleaning on that's site right. drop off you have the pickup pick and drop up, off exactly process right um yeah no that's definitely true all right so the next question um comes in from lee and he actually didn't get any responses i figured this would be a good time to kind of mention it, especially because we already talked about response a bit he asked how do you guys use response bid with service monster um do you all just use response for follow-up and then and, and so on And really just kind of just to get this out there for everyone, the way that it works is response bid is going to be having this bid and follow up that goes on to try and make a sale. When that initially is chosen, it will pull over certain information. It'll create an estimate within service monster and it'll let you know when they've chosen what items for that estimate are actually going to be worked. So it'll update the estimate. It'll also pull through to your schedule through a Google event. 
Now, some of this is a little bit clunky. They're aware of it. We're aware of it. They're making some major changes on their end. Their data is just stored differently than ours. Yeah. And so they're going through that update, and it's going to make it a lot more polished. Much tighter integration. Yeah. And we're willing to do what we need to do on our end, too, for direct integration partner with, with uh, Responsive because Kurt and his team have been really good. I've watched them kind of age over the few years uh, they've been around, and they just are really well received. And plus, Bobby Walker is freaking gaga over him. Absolutely. Over him. Yeah. Bobby loves him. Um, I do have a podcast with him. Uh, he's got this podcast he does. It's actually a really it's good really podcast, good. too. Yeah. If you guys haven't listened to it, you should definitely go what find it. What was it called? I'm forgetting the name, and I hate myself for it. Yeah. I knew you were going to ask me, too. I know. Well, while you do that, I'll plug another podcast that's coming out here shortly, uh, the Blue Collar Podcasts, um, Eric and uh, Larry. And so they um, they put together a really nice podcast, and they, they're doing a special event that they call the 21 Titans of the Service Industry. And so they invited me to be one of their 21 guests, and they recorded all 21 episodes, and they're starting to release that. Is that yesterday? I can't remember what the date is. Anyways, we can post a link in the show notes um, if you're interested in that. If you sign up, then you know they're going to do every day for 21 days. They're going to release a, a new wow. guest, and you know myself, Howard Partridge, like um, I think Zig Ziglar's son, like you know a couple fairly heavy hitters or you know uh are well represented there so i would suggest you go check that out yeah also his his uh podcast is called journey of a new entrepreneur that's bobby's podcast yeah yeah all right and then the last one was just um came in from matt it's detailing kind of a bug that that we're already aware of and the fix is going to be out it was out for the majority of users but there is one little other process that we're figuring out with the notes Oh, on how, mobile. On mobile. But the reason I wanted to showcase it is Matt's kind of went above and beyond. He actually recorded his phone, went through the exact process that he was in. And I can tell you guys this. Sometimes finding out a bug is like a needle in a haystack. Yep. And the more information you guys give us the and the better. easier it's presented, the better. You don't even know. He sent me DM and gave me more data. So, um, you know, I don't know if you guys, if Brian's got a bead on it or not, but I've got more information too. Um, I thought it might be a caching issue, which means it should be easily recreatable and fixable. But um, I'll get you that soon. But it was perfect. Matt did a great job helping us identify it um, I, and giving us the information needed to really chase it down instead of being like, it's broke. Right. Like, what the hell does that mean? And sometimes I get you don't necessarily know the You're questions not to ask. Well, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. But it it saves the back and forth. So sometimes it's not even that like no one's being ignored. Like we're we dedicate ourselves to finding these issues and getting them resolved. You better believe it. Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes you're just like, okay, I have to follow up with you because we're hunting. Like we don't know which pathway to even look if I don't at least know what browser you're on or what mobile platform you're right. on. Especially if it's not systemic, right? Exactly. If, if everyone in the platform is receiving the same error, that's easy. Mm-hmm. That's easy. And if they're and if it's occurring in dev. Super easy. Yep. You'll figure out where it's happening, eliminate it. But if it's like 1%, 3% of our user base and these weird conditions or conditions that wouldn't appear to be weird to them but are such an anomaly when stacked against a larger sample set, yep. it's like, uh, how do we find that? Developers go, I can't recreate it. Even if they think they know what's wrong, as an engineer, if I cannot recreate the problem, I cannot confirm that I fixed it once yep. I put something in place because I can't execute the test again and confirm that it's been fixed. And so they're trained here to say, can't recreate it, man. I, I don't know what to do because I'm not going to have them wasting times and potential solutions that provide no guarantee for fix. Otherwise, we're going to be chasing stuff here that are phantoms forever and get no work done so um from an engineering point of view the more data the better the more data means that we're more likely to be able to recreate the issue if we can recreate it we can know what's going on and once we fix it we can then test it against the problem that we were able to recreate and if it no longer occurs fixed so again, so, we're not going to ignore anything that you guys ask, even if it literally is just it's broke. Yeah, we'll 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 help you dig into. Well, the we issue. have different layers, right? right? Engineer, I say engineers don't touch it if it can't isn't reproducible. That doesn't mean that you and Brenda and 
you know, the rest of the team on the support sales and onboarding side aren't trying their best to recreate it. Right. Because that's what that's what a lot of times. Well, Brenda's really good at this. You're really good at this. Is taking user feedback that goes, "It's broke," and translating that into a, "I've got one customer that has one account, and this is a one data point that when it's null has this behavior. Yep. Can we protect that field from being null so that this doesn't happen?" Yep. And then done. And so you translate that, but sometimes we can't translate it, or we can't find or identify a process that the um, that recreates the issue yep. or data the better <laughs> absolutely uh, uh, that's all i got joe very good well i think this was a profitable podcast yeah if you paid attention to that first part there's lots of nuggets in there please find us on all of your favorite podcasting platforms youtube facebook and instagram come join us share like engage subscribe See love you, you guys time. bye